Welcome to the 225th regular monthly meeting of the New York Linux Users Group. Tonight we have Paul Zakowski who will be giving us a talk on ZFS on Linux. I'd like to say how much we appreciate our sponsor, Two Sigma, for continuing to provide this lovely space. And thank you to everyone here for taking the opportunity to join us tonight. Our host, Two Sigma, is hiring. You can speak to the folks in the back there if you're on the market. Jim and Pavel. Uh, tonight, before we get started, we have our usual request. Silence your cell phones. Do not eat snacks in noisy wrappers during the presentation. As usual, we will be recording tonight's meeting and posting it on our YouTube channel within a few weeks. You can find the link in the meetup.com meeting comments when it's ready. Please save questions for the end and use the microphones for questions so you can be heard in the recording. We'd like to take a moment to thank all of our sponsors, past and pre present, including DigitalOcean, Two Sigma, Bloomberg, IBM, Canonical, Brandor Group, Google, and Pearson for their support. In addition, Nylog would not be able to function without our many volunteers who have contributed greatly over the years. Um, as workshops, please talk to Simo or Hannah. Um, Simo? Um, Afterwards, if you'd like to know more about our workshops, uh, they are also looking for any volunteers to help organize workshops. They're happening in the NYU Silver Building, room 512, 32 Waverly Place. The next workshop will be next Tuesday, April 2nd, from 7 to 9 p.m., and is on the NYLUG Meetup page. Uh, we don't have a general meeting planned for uh, April, but um, we will have a uh, meeting in May um, and potentially a Red Hat meeting in uh, June. Uh, check, keep posted on the meetup page for those. RSVPs will open two weeks in advance of NILUG events, and if you're on the NILUG list, you'll get an announcement of RSVP opening. Uh, after the presentation, we'll be heading to Cupping Room Cafe, 359 West Broadway, two blocks east of here. Uh, we'll be heading over in groups, so if you've never been, no worries. And final reminders, silence your phones, put away loud wrappers, uh, recording this, so use the mics for questions at the end. And now, to introduce our speaker, Paul Zakowski. Paul Zakowski is a senior software engineer at Dado Inc., working on their ZFS team, previously principal engineer at Oracle and GreenBytes, and VP of engineering at HeartLab. Please welcome Paul Zakowski, giving us ZFS on Linux. Thank you, Brian. Can everybody hear me okay? Good? All right, great. Um, thank you, everybody, for coming out to hear me talk about this tonight. Um, let's get started right into it. I'm Paul Zakowski. Um, I've been working on ZFS since about 2007, so not as long as some people, but a pretty long time, um, mainly as a software developer on that. Um, I work for Dado, which is based in Norwalk, Connecticut, and I'm a Rhode Islander, so if I have a, say a few words that sound like I'm from Family Guy, that you then to be forgiven, born and raised. Quick thank you to Nylug and my company Datto for giving me a little time to work on this, and also to a guy I found on the web, Aaron Topons, who had a bunch of examples of pools that I wasn't didn't have time to create with lots of disks in them and stuff like that. So you'll see some of his samples pasted in here. Okay, so Z the ZFS history is as follows. Uh, started in 2001 at Sun, uh, Jeff Bonwick and Matt Ahrens were the two developers who started working on it back then. Um, some of you will remember that in 2005, the code was open sourced and released at opensolaris.org. And then it was, uh, I think in 2006 or 7, it was actually released as a point release in Solaris 10. Um, then in 2008, it was released on FreeBSD. That was a port that I'll talk about a little bit later. Um, in 2009, Oracle acquired Sun, and that was the end of the uh, open source part of it. As you can see there, that Oracle stopped contributing, and they kind of shut down the site, etc. 
So shortly after that, some of the founders and uh, early engineers on, on ZFS from Sun, who were no longer with Oracle, went off on their own and they founded Illumos. And you can still go to illumos.org and see their, the work there. And that's the, the open successor to Open Solaris. Fast forward a little, in 2013 it was ported and uh, GA'd on Linux. And in, also in 2013, some of these different factions that were out there working on it, they kind of banded together and formed something called OpenZFS. Um, you'll be pleased to know that someone's working on a port to Mac OS X, OS X, and that's been released so people can get on there and play with that. And the same guy, I believe, is, believe it or not, working on a port to Windows. So you actually see in all its backslash glory there on Windows. Just a little side story here that ZFS was almost part of Mac OS back in 2007 because it was, it was still kind of open back then and, and people at Apple had kind of grabbed onto it. Their file system was getting a little long in the tooth. Uh, HFS, I think it is. Um, and Schwartz made this announcement here that it, it has become the file system in Mac OS X10. Well, I don't know if Steve Jobs got wind of that or what happened and didn't want to be out announced on it, but that never happened. That project was canceled. And uh, so just a little footnote there. You can go read about it at the uh, at, uh, Adam Leventhal's blog there. OK, what is ZFS? The three main tenets of ZFS are pooled storage, there's a transactional object design, and it's obsessed with provable end-to-end -end data integrity. I'm going to talk about those three things. The idea behind this original design of ZFS was that you could add disk to your pool just like you would add RAM to your system. So, for example, when you put RAM in your system, you don't have to go edit a file in your Etsy folder to say that you did it and fuss with a bunch of RAM mount options or anything like that. So ZFS has the same kind of concept, and it's as simple as zpool create in the name of the pool and the name of the disk. And then if you want to expand that pool, zpool add the name of the disk and the name of the pool. There's a bunch of other options with this zpool command that we're going to get into as we talk about the different kinds of disk redundancy patterns that are available. Just a real simple diagram here. That all the disks are available to the pool, and the file systems then sit on top of the pool and have access to all the disks through the pool abstraction. So there's no way for a certain file system to just use these two disks, for example. They're all going to use all the disks. Kind of eliminates the distinction between a volume manager and a file system. As I mentioned, <coughs> excuse me, provable end-to-end -end data integrity. The incoming data is checksummed. That checksum is stored when the block is committed. Um, the checksum is actually not co-located with the payload of the block. It's stored in the parent block pointer. So you have a little bit of segregation between those two. So if something goes wrong with that region where the actual data is, you still have the checksum stored in another part of possibly even another disk. When ZFS does a read, every time it reads, it, ver it computes the checksum from the data that it just read in for that block. And then it verifies the checksum that's stored against the checksum that it just computed on the read. If it finds a mismatch and another copy is available, we'll talk about the redundancy a little bit later, then there's a self-healing feature that it'll go use the correct copy and then go patch and use copy on write to fix the bad one. Metadata, whether you have a redundant disk arrangement like a mirror or a RAID or not, the metadata itself is dittoed three times. So the metadata is considered more important because it could sever you from getting to all kinds of other data if it fails. So that's part of the self-healing because there's multiple copies of the metadata that can be grabbed and patched in.
This just kind of depicts what I was talking about and had in text on the previous slide. As I mentioned, the block checksum is stored in the parent block pointer. Um, a way to think about it is when you're in an indirect block and you're about to go get and descend further down the tree, you already have in that parent the checksum of the block you're about to go read. Okay? That's why, like, this top green checksum here is, is the checksum for this data. This one, this checksum is the checksum for this data block. So, <coughs> Basically, it forms a self-validating Merkle tree, and uh, this is a trivial example of a big file. You're going to have this huge uh, tree of indirect blocks before you finally get down to the, what we call the L0, level 0 data blocks themselves. Just another slide on the self-healing feature. In this case, a mirror. So we issue a read, and we find a checksum mismatch, meaning the block is corrupt. ZFSing goes, because this is a mirror, everything that's here is also here. It gets the good copy, satisfies the read with that by returning that known good block to the application, and then it issues a write, an asynchronous write, to go ahead and put down the correct data. ZFS is a transactional object system. So there's no such thing as an FSCK or a check disk for ZFS. The data was either written or it wasn't. I have, some, I have some pictures to show that in a second. It's a copy on write file system, which means that you never overwrite data in place. If you're going to overwrite something, you write it to a new copy and you mark the previous region as free. As I'll show on the slide coming up, copy on write, you almost get snapshots for free, which is really nice. So as I mentioned, this is just your initial block tree. Let's just pretend this is a small file with four blocks in it. This is the L0, L1, L2, and you have the single L3 block up at the top. These are indirect, and these are your actual data blocks, the L0. Let's overwrite the first two blocks in the file. We're going to copy on write. The green is the new data. We haven't, because we write to a new region, these two blue ones still exist. We haven't tried to overwrite that exact block location. They're still there. Calculate the new checksum, which has to be stored in the parent. So now we're going to go up the tree. We're going to copy on write the indirect blocks and work our way up the tree. Finally, the topmost or uber block is rewritten. This is the point at which we have all the old data and all the new data preserved. We haven't overwritten anything. Which is why ZFS basically has constant time snapshots. If you were to actually prevent, through some simple logic, these blue blocks from being freed by the freeing algorithms that take this and make it available to, to subsequent writes, then you've basically got a snapshot and you've preserved all that data. It's actually cheaper to take a snapshot than it is to let the data be freed. If you kicked out the power plug prior to, let's go back a second. If you kicked out the power plug prior to that Uber block being updated, then the green never happened because the top one was never committed. There's no way to get to this. These are just basically still, these green ones, when the system powers back up, are going to be free space. And you're at the point where you have your blue blocks intact. That's why I said previously that the data is either written or it isn't. It's an, it's an atomic transactional write. Before I move on to some other concepts, are there any questions about those first three sort of topics? And as Brian mentioned, just you can go to the mic if you want to ask a question.
First item, what is the checksum calculation? Oh, you had to ask me that. Uh, <laughs> those are actually settable. There's, there's a variety of ones you can use. Um, there's a SHA-256. Um, okay. I'm trying to think of some of the other ones. That's not the default because it's a little more compute intensive. Um, I'd have to look. There's a bunch of them. Okay. Second question. Since we have data structures that live on multiple drives, Yes. What happens when you and you and drives frequently have things like write caches and other odd failure modes? What happens if you lose one of the drives? Let's make it the most inconvenient possible one. That's you have everything. On your, on everything else has been updated, but not the root. Or maybe conversely. Some the root has been up. Everything's been updated, including the root, except for the small fact that some number of drives have right. bit the bucket in some okay. weird way. It sounds like there's two questions. One is about the just the, what's the redundancy level of your pool, and I'm going to talk about that. But the other one, what I think you're getting at is you were about to write out all this data just before the Uber block, and something went wrong with the disk in your multi-disk pool. Then it never happened. Well, the problem is that the modern disks are unfortunately not quite as simple as one might like from a failure analysis point of view. Right. They can stop spinning and preserve their caches, well, sort of, if the batteries are still good, dot, 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 right. dot. There's lots of odd failure modes floating around. And I don't 100% know how to answer that one, I guess. As far as ZFS interacting with the hardware, there's definitely measures taken in there so that what it really wants is what I said, is like the write happened or it didn't. Like acknowledge the write and you took ownership of that as the physical hardware layer or you didn't. Yes, sir. Okay, it's been a few years since, since CompSci, so I just want to confirm. When you say that this is all a Merkle tree, does that mean that your core file table is a B tree? It's a... Uh, it's a tree of block pointers. But is it, so is it one, each node has two children, or is it uh, n children? Or? Each, um, there's some configurability to that. OK. I believe that each indirect block can point to 128 block pointers. OK. Um, thank you. And uh, uh, not, it's uh, non-head access for file writes. If you have a large file and you need to write to the middle of it, how does ZFS handle that? Um, it can use, I believe, that we can use math to like, if it's in this huge four block file and you only want to do the third one, it knows not to go down this side of the tree. Got it'll it. come so, over you, to so you still have to replace a whole block, but you can do it? Yes. Okay. Math. Got it's it. smart about that. Thanks. All right, thank Oh, okay, thank you. One quick question about the self-healing. I assume that's where you'd handle actual hardware failure, like a, a bad sector on a disk that's mm -hmm. not writable. How, how is that detected and then managed uh, going forward? So a write failure. Yeah, but on an actual hardware. Okay, in that case, um, the application is going to get an error, and the Uber block will not be updated and you won't get into a bad state. Um, the self-healing I always refer to more happens on the read side because it has a checksum and it's reading in the payload, computes the checksum, compares them. If it detects a problem and it has a redundant copy, it's going to fix it right then. Even though you're reading, it's going to go issue a write to fix that. Is it going to mark it so that that sector is out of the pool going forward? It's going to mark that as bad. I'm not certain about that. That would make sense, though, I think. <laughs> I hope it does do that, actually. All right, thank you for those questions. Within the ZFS, we have the, the concept of virtual devices known as VDEVs. They're a virtual representation of one or more physical devices. Um, if you're playing around as a developer, your device can be a file, so you can just like do the truncate command 
create a sparse file and create a pool against it and start developing without having to like, I work on vi virtual machines a lot, so I don't want to have to fiddle with the VM manager and create an SDA and an SDB and all this stuff. Often you can just do a file, but people don't do serious work with a file as their leaf or lowest level VDEV. Normally they're physical drives, which can be anything that can present under the slash dev folder as, as a disk to Linux. And as we start a hinting at, you can start to com combo these drives into different mirror and RAID configurations, which I'm going to talk about pretty soon. Oh, th there's my example. Like, trunk, I created two files of the truncate command, and then I did zpool create tank, which is kind of like the standard hello world name of a, of a pool. And I use the keyword mirror, and I've got my two disks, file one and file two, which are the two pairs of a single mirror. Um, show you what that looks like in the ZFS UI, the, the character user interface that we have. These are the leaf VDEVs, which are your actual concrete lowest level drives that get written to, known as leaf, leaf VDEVs. And in this pool, there's a single top level VDEV. That's the point at which ZFS and application, that, that the pool itself is issuing the reads and writes are at this level, the top level VDEV. They write to the mirror. There's another abstraction layer in the software that says, oh, I'm a mirror. I've got to write to the same place on both disks. That's a zpool status command that you get to look at your pool layout. And normally, they're not all zeros. It's all <laughs> you start using the pool. So there are three disk redundancy levels that are available. There's Stripe, which is no redundancy. Uh, there's Mirror, which I showed a little bit, or RAID 1. And then there's RAID Z, which is ZFS version of it's kind of akin to a RAID 5. And we're going to dig into that a little, little more deeply. It's obviously a software-based RAID. So here's a, a simple zpool create command with four disks, which are just striped. They're going to be written in round robin fashion, and there's no redundancy. So if you lose even one disk, you won't, your data is inaccessible. Okay. So this is what that output looks like. You don't have that little top level. The the the, the top level vdev is just the stripe. It's going to Write to E, then F, then G, and H, and round robin around. Oh, there's our example again, a RAID 1 or a mirror, which I kind of talked about previously when I was showing you the, uh, the way to do it with files. So in this case, you can one, lose one of these disks and keep functioning. The pool will keep, keep on going. Another concept to remember is that your top-level VDEVs are always striped. Remember I talked about the round robin? So in this case, I have two top-level VDEVs. They're mirrors. And writes then are going to alternate between the first mirror, mirror 0 and mirror 1. In this case, you could theoretically lose two disks if you're lucky and you don't lose the two from the same mirror. <laughs> you could lose two disks and your pool would keep working. OK, before I talk about RAID Z, which is the ZFS style, just a quick look at traditional RAID 5. If you have three disks, the data is going to be striped on two of them, and parity would be stored on the third. It doesn't have to be a dedicated disk like in RAID 4. So in this case, the data might go on disk 1 and 2 and the parity on 3. And then 2 and 3 will get the data, and 1 will get the parity. And it will rotate around like that. In, ra in RAID 5, the stripe, stripe width is fixed. So if you're not utilizing the full stripe, this can lead to read, modify, write cycles, which are inefficient.
The other problem with traditional RAID 5 that ZFS kind of set out to solve was that the data writes and then the parity write are not atomic. They're not written together. I mean, they try, they're issued at the same time, but you could, become, you could get very unlucky and lose power. After you wrote the data, but you didn't write the parity. And the system goes down and you come back up and the parity that was calculated for that stripe is basically whatever garbage was on the disk at that point. That's known as the right hole, which is something that uh, Jeff Bonwick set out to solve with the, with the RAID-Z implementation. So in ZFS, this is supposed to show that the stripe width is dynamic. So the orange, <laughs> I say men are kind of co more colorblind, so I don't know, that uh, this one's got eight, a, st a stripe width of eight blocks and requires two parity writes. This yellow one is three, as is the green one, and the other one is just one. So this is just meant to show you that it doesn't have to be fixed like in a traditional RAID 5. That's good. I think I'm going to talk about why it's good in a second. Yes, this is why it's good. As I mentioned, the uh, fixed width stripe forces you into, into frequent read, modify, write situations. This doesn't do that. It just uses the size that it needs for the data that you've asked to be written out with RAID Z. Um, there is no partial stripe update because of copy on write. So you would never say, hey, I have this stripe on RAID. It's going to be, it's 256K, and I'm only going to write 128. And then I'm going to append a little bit to it, and I'm going to use the full 256. You would never do that in ZFS. You would never like read it in and write it back to the same place because we're a copy on write file system. Okay, so you never have that sort of updating of a partial stripe. It's all full stripe width. Parity writes are transactional with the data stripe writes. Remember way back in the green and blue slide, if that top Uber block either got written or it didn't. So that same kind of concept applies here to the RAID Z. You'll never have that bad situation of the right hole that I talked about earlier. We talked about the easy case when I had the diagram up with the mirror and the little lightning bolt and the red and green where the red was the bad block that got red. And then, oh, I found the green, the good block on the other side of the mirror. It read it in and self-healed. It can do the same thing with RAID Z. So if for some reason, the checksums read in and it doesn't match. You have the checksum, you read in the block and it doesn't match its checksum. You can use the RAID information to recalculate that block and fix it. Oh, satisfy the read with the correct data, which is job one, and then go fix it so that other people don't, the next readers don't stumble onto that bad block. So ZFS has RAID Z1, RAID Z2, and RAID Z3, and those simply represent the number of parity writes that you're going to have for, the, for your RAID Z, single, double, or triple parity. Here's an example. This is a pretty typical configuration that you would do for an archiving system. Um, rather than quote, I don't want to use the word waste, but um, if you made these all mirrors, then you're effectively only able to use half the storage that you purchased in disk. So this gives you a little more space efficiency with some redundancy. Um, in this case, we have three top-level VDEVs, each with a three-disk RAID Z1, 0, 1, and 2. So those are your three top-level VDEVs, and you're going to round-robin around your writes and use those three. Another nice thing with this, rather than making one huge RAID Z1 with nine disks in it, is you get some parallelization out of this because you've got three top levels to write and read, to write to and read from, okay?
asynchronous versus synchronous writes. ZFS is, was kind of designed from the ground up for async writing. Okay, and that's the default. So for your general purpose bulk storage, you just go ahead, accept that default, and you can do your asynchronous writes. Some applications that require sync semantics, like databases, NFS, and some of your iSCSI targets, they require synchronous writes. So first of all, ZFS will obey the semantics, and it'll, it'll do the sync. And it won't acknowledge the write back to the application until it's actually committed. In other words, that Uber block was written to stable storage. There's no administrative steps for you to get to that. It just works. If your application's not asking for sync semantics, but you want it to be synchronous, you can set a property on the file system, sync equals always, and that'll force everything on that file system to be a sync write. And, okay, sync write is accomplished via the ZIL, the ZFS intent log, which I'm going to further explain. ZIL is a set of data structures that contain logged writes. So when those writes come in, they are written to the ZIL, to this log. That satisfies the synchronous write request. Later, those are flushed from those data structures onto the primary pool and into stable storage. As I mentioned, they are synchronous, so there's no acknowledgement back unless they happened. Um, because you could start to see how this could get backed up, the, the designers have put in something called a slog, which is a separate log. It allows you to have, put in a faster device like an SSD or NVRAM or something like this to be strictly the place where that intent log is written. And that can really speed up your synchronous workloads. Um, it doesn't need to be large because <clears throat> ZFS goes in cycles of admitting data and then syncing it out to disk, and it runs on basically a five-second timer. So you really only need to be able to hold five to ten seconds worth of data on that zill of synchronous writes before it's then flushed to the pool and that space can get reused. If the system goes down after you've written the zill, but before it's been flushed to the pool and committed to the stable storage of the main pool, and you boot the system back up, it knows, ZFS knows this, and it replays the intent log for you. So those, lo those logged blocks actually get put into the pool as was supposed to happen before the power went down. Here's the output. Um, the top command is just the zpool add. You're adding a log device. They're often mirrored for further uh, data protection because it could be a single point of failure. In the case I mentioned, if it was a single disk, it didn't get committed to the main pool, you reboot it and that disk was bad, then you really don't have that data anymore and you told the application you had it, so that's, that's no bueno. And it just shows in the output like this. It's just a little separate section called logs. Okay, before I go on to caching, were there any questions about Zill and some of those other concepts? We went through the redundancy levels, RAID, mirror, striping, round robin. Any questions on that? All right, great. In order to try to accelerate things, IO, ZFS uses a caching strategy. It's a RAM-based adaptive replacement cache, and we call it ARC. It caches blocks, or the primary object that's put in the ARC. It combines an MRU most recently used and an MFU most frequently used algorithm. And based on what your workload is, if you have a really high count of frequently used blocks, that MFU region will expand and use more of the ARC than the MRU, and vice versa. So it's somewhat adaptable and a flexible approach. Um, it's common to use a lot of RAM with ZFS for this reason, because if your read can be satisfied by the ARC, it's really a performance win, because you're just getting it right out of memory without going out to the disks. 
both reads and writes go through the arc in the software path. So when you write something, it's cached. It's also written to disk, of course. Because RAM is finite, there was an idea to extend the caching to the next fastest medium, or media, which in this case would be something like an SSD or NVRAM, and that's called a level two arc, or L2 arc. Just before blocks get evicted from the arc, because there are all kinds of cleanup and eviction strategies, as more data comes in, old, less recently used, less frequently used data has to be evicted, kicked out. Before that happens, if you have an L2 arc, it'll be written there. And the arc will still know about it. And if you ask for that data on a read and you get an arc miss from RAM, it'll try to get it from the L2 if it knows it's there. And at least you'll have a somewhat faster read from that device. You know you have an L2 arc, it's the keyword cache. It's, uh, in this case, just a striped couple of partitions on a SSD in this example. ZFS file systems. These are sort of your volumes or your folders or whatever abstraction you want to think of. They sit on top of the pool and they're presented as mount points for people to use. So this is where things kind of hit the road on a POSIX level. As I mentioned before, in this case I have two file systems, backup and users. They both can use the whole pool. So if the pool is 10 terabytes and you do nine terabytes of backup, it'll use everything it can get from the pool and leave less for the users. Now, there are some quotas and reservations, different properties you can set on your file systems to control this uh, if you need to. Just want to get the concept there that file systems can use the whole pool. Okay. And here's just some examples to show that um, file systems are net can be nested. Uh, that they have properties that you can set. You can set properties when you create a file system. You can set them after the fact. I don't think I have to read off the nesting. I think everybody gets that. Okay. But each nesting level is not just a folder. It's an actual another file system. And that comes in handy for things like snapshotting, because snapshotting occurs at the, at the file system or data set level. I'm going to talk about that in a little bit. Properties are per data set. They can be inherit. They are by default inherited, and they can be overridden with the ZFS set command. ZFS set property equals value in the name of the file system. Very simple user interface. Okay, ZFS compression. Compression is recommended. <laughs> Excuse me. And it's just expressed ZFS set compression equals on. If you just say on, it uses the, the default, which is LZ, LZJB. Um, there are a bunch of choices there <coughs> that you can use. Almost everybody runs ZFS with some, some form of compression, just because with CPUs being fairly abundant in these systems and fast, it's kind of a win in terms of CPU usage versus the space you can recoup. Compression does happen on each at the block level. Each block is compressed when it's written. It's decompressed when it's read. LZ4 right now is one of the more recent ones that was added. It seems to be sort of the sweet spot in terms of it's not terrible on CPU usage, and it gives you a fairly good level of compression depending on what your data is. If it's compressible or not. Inside the code, it's sort of a extensible plug-in architecture, so you can, as new compression algorithms become available, it's not too hard for developers to go in and plug those in and play with them. Compression's not retroactive. 
So if you have a bunch of data in a file system and you go ZFS set compression equals on, it doesn't go back and recompress everything. It's only go forward from that point. So that exercise left to the reader on how to copy it to another file system and get it compressed. ZFS deduplication. OK. Your mileage may vary on this one. Um, I have a lot of personal experience and scars with this. From my time at Green Bytes, we tried to be a dedupe company with, uh, with ZFS, with some success and some, some tough, rough patches. Uh, it's block-based dedupe. So when a block is written, if you're using a cryptographic level checksum like the SHA-256 that I mentioned before, that's calculated and then looked up in a table, pool wide, so you know when you're receiving a block and you have dedupe enabled, take that checksum, look it up on the table. If you have it, then you don't have to write that block. You just simply use its address and increment the reference count in the table. Applications like Net Backup and RMAN and TAR <laughs> and others do things to the data when they write it, when they package it and put it onto your network attached storage running ZFS or whatever. They do things that cause block misalignment. So if you can imagine a simple example like in a TAR file, it puts a little timestamp or some signature right at the beginning of the file that changes every time you do it, even though all you did was append a, a file right at the end. You've sort of like, or you've added a block or a byte right at the beginning of a file and offset all the data inside that big file, you just ruined all your dedupe because the checksum is not going to be on nice block boundaries anymore. It's all going to be recalculated and you're going to have dedupe misses. So people who, like me, who have tried to do dedupe applications before put a lot of energy into trying to do things like, oh, let me take this data and pad it or let me take this as it's coming in and block align it and look for markers in the data stream and stuff like that and try to play games. Because if you can get it to work, the dedupe, and you're doing things like backup, you can get you know 10 to 1 dedupe ratios, 20 to 1 dedupe ratios, and really um, save a lot on your storage budget. But again, challenges are there. They're dragons to be slayed. There are issues with fitting the dedupe table in RAM. It tends to start to take up a lot of the arc space. And if those get kicked out and you need to update that block reference count, then you've got to do a bunch of random I.O. to all the different disks in the sync phase of writing, which is not something you want to do because I mentioned we're on like this five-second budget where we're kind of like ingesting, ingesting for four seconds. And that last second is like flush that data out, sync it, update the Uber block, done. If in that last second when you're supposed to be updating stuff, you're going like, oh, I have a, I have a DDT reference I need to update the reference count on. Well, where is that now? Oh, it's over on this disk. Go read it. You're inserting synchronous reads into your write path, which is not a good thing. Oh, and you have to mention the pathological delete performance, which is another problem with ZFS dedupe. Um, basically, without dedupe, when you delete something in ZFS, it's more or less free. There's, there's nothing that really needs to happen. There are some space maps that are used internally and written to disk, part of the metadata, that records free space regions on your VDEVs versus used space regions so that when you're writing new data, you know where you're able to put it. Um, that's essentially free. In dedupe, that's not the case. If, when you want to delete something that's deduplicated, you need to decrement the reference count on each block. And in order to do that, you have to write, because you went from 10 to 9 to 8 to 7, whatever. By the time you're about to update that Uber block, that final number needs to be recorded in the metadata of ZFS. And uh, that can lead to pathological behavior in ZFS, like NFS timeouts and applications timing out, things like that. So if anybody wants to try to grab that 20 to 1 savings, you can go to github.com ZFS on Linux slash ZFS, grab the code and see if you want to wrestle with the dedupe algorithms on there and fix some of the things I mentioned. It's, it's, it's out there for the taking, for the bold. All right.
I sort of just alluded to where we have these space maps that are basically bitmaps of available space and used, used space on all your VDEVs that comprise the pool. Um, so that's part of ZFS's block allocation strategy. Um, the too long don't read on it is spread everything out. Um, the thinking being if you've got, if you're packing everything into the, the beginning or end of a, di of a hard drive and that region goes sour on you, then you, your allocation strategy had you put all your blocks there, then that's kind of a bad thing. So spread it out. I've already mentioned about the round robining across the striped VDEVs. The, the block location is known as the data virtual address or DVA. Um, so if you take this essence of take my L0 blocks, which are actually my actual payload, my user data, and spread it out over all the disks. And then, remember I showed you we copy on write up the tree of indirect blocks. All those need to get written out to a new location every time because of copy on write. Metadata tends to be kind of small, so sort of a buckshot approach where you have a nice big free region on your disk and you put a little 3K write in there or something, now you've split it in half and made it small, and you keep doing that, and you get this sort of Swiss cheese effect. So all that's a long way of saying it's prone to, ZFS is prone to fragmentation. It can look like you have a lot of free space, but it's actually struggling and, and having trouble finding contiguous regions of like 128K, which is a typical block size that we use, 256K, one meg, finding those regions and struggling and looking around through the tables. So, just like compression, the code is extensible here to allow um, other algorithms be besides the first fit sort of algorithm that's in there. So developers, get yourself onto ZFS Linux there and play with that. That's, this is something that's been talked about endlessly. It's like, oh, well, let's develop one where we have all the big blocks kind of live together so that we don't riddle them with buckshot holes and all the little blocks can live in some region we don't care about. So it's out there, but to my knowledge, this particular issue has not been addressed. ZPool scrub. This is your sort of disk checking, disk verification, hygiene facility that's available in ZFS. Um, as I mentioned, I've sort of been harping on, when you read, you can do the self-healing. Right? I think everybody's heard me say that a couple of times now. ZPool scrub is nothing but a process that reads in everything in the pool. Okay? And because reads check against the checksum, they do the self-healing if they can, so it's good to read everything. It should be regularly scheduled. Um, now in 2019, large disks mean people have large pools. So where I work at Datto, we have a bunch of these servers running ZFS on Linux. It, is, it takes forever to scrub one of these. So it's sort of like painting a bridge. So you paint it and you get all the way to the other side and you get everything painted and you have to go start on the other side again because where you start is getting rusty already. So when it finishes, it's probably just time to put it in a cron or something and just have it always, always scrubbing. It's a low-level process that it'll only read when the system's kind of idle or not otherwise you know, being pounded with user I.O. So it's, fairly, it's a fairly conservative thing to just let it go and it doesn't interfere too much with your primary job of pool I.O. Any questions? Yeah, sure. He's going to go first, and then you. Um, <clears throat> I used DFS in production about a year ago. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the things that um, I think was still being worked on at the time was combining the Arc cache and the Linux native uh, file system cache. Um, do you know the status of that? Are they unified yet, or are they still two separate caches that don't know separate. about each other? Yeah. I'm okay. not sure about that. That's part of the sort of Solaris heritage that didn't work as well, unfortunately, yeah. when it was brought over. So if, in your example, did it cause you to really kind of need more RAM than you otherwise yeah, we, would have needed we to? Yeah, we used a ton of RAM to make sure that we had enough for the yeah. ARC. 
Um, and then the other question I had, which is kind of like the current state of ZFS is um, going back to compression. We did a ton of ZFS sends. We had um, different servers and different continents, mm -hmm. and we were keeping them in sync by having one write master and then sending the, the deltas to yes. the read-only slaves. So we were doing that all the time. And a feature that I was eagerly awaiting that was always coming soon <laughs> was um, to not have ZFS send, well, not to not have ZFS decompress off of yes. disk to then recompress it during the send to then uncompress it on the receive to then recompress it on the receive. Exactly. So yeah, we, that's we, known as raw send. Yeah. So just take the block basically kind of as it is compressed right. and transmit it, which makes total sense. That is still coming, coming soon. <laughs> it's in the next release. <laughs> oh, okay. Which is called 8.0. So cool. That's going to be coming soon, I guess. Um, yeah, if anyone wants to talk about ZFS production war stories, come find me after. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. I also have a couple of questions. Yes. Uh, the first one, uh, do you have to scrub if you write and re rewrite a lot? Uh, because actually, in that case, it looks like it's excessive to do a scrub, because when you write and rewrite, you do recalculations. Uh, what do you think about it? So you're saying if you're frequently overwriting yeah. most of your for data? For example, if you if you use, uh, for example, ZFS for uh, virtual machine volume storage and you write a lot, so actually you do scrub when you write because you recalculate checksums and write, and when you read them back, you do checksums again. So right. it looks like the whole pool scrubbing is a little bit excessive. What is your opinion about that? Well, I don't want to say something that's going to make anybody lose data by not scrubbing, but in your case, it sounds like you're, you're probably okay to not have to have it scrubbing all the time. Okay. And another question is about uh, data spreading uh, among VDFs. Is it, is it really round robin or is it uh, weighted round robin? Because actually you, you can have VDFs of diff diff different size, and actually it looks like that ZFS tries to uh, feel that VDFs uh, in uh, average, it looks like it tries to weight mm -hmm. the lot of VDFs. How, how does it uh, uh, weight, uh, weight the data between VDFs? It, does it use really weighted round robin or it tries to uh, spread the data blocks of size between uh, VDFs to make them balance it? Right, so to rephrase the question I th is, in, help me, is if you have a top level VDEV that has more space than the other ones for some yeah. reason, it's bigger yeah. or was added recently, whereas the other ones had been there for a while, is there a bias toward that, uh, that VDEV with more free space on it? I think the answer is yes. So it's uh, some, some kind of weighted? Yes. OK, good. Thank you. Yep. I'd have to look in the code to understand. I haven't looked at that in a while to understand exactly how smart it is. But github.com slash you can <laughs> get on there. <laughs> Thank you for those questions. ZFS resilver. This is when you replace a disk that's gone bad in one of your redundant disk levels, like a RAID or a mirror. Um, and resilver is ZFS's word for copying blocks onto that fresh disk, that replacement disk. It's not a DD, so it's not just brute copying, which in some ways I kind of almost wish it was, because what it actually does, it scans through all your metadata to figure out which DVAs, which, which blocks have a DVA that are assigned to that disk that you're replacing. It finds the good copy and puts it on there. It puts it on the new VDEV. Um, this can take time. Uh, and with bigger disks, it can take a painful amount of time, uh, an amount of time that could leave you exposed to data loss. Because if you're RAID Z1, and you can only afford to lose one disk, and you have one that's resilvering for a month, 
That's probably not satisfactory. And you're, gonna, you're seeing people do things like being forced to go to double parity or triple parity or triple mirroring and things like this that are possible in ZFS um, but aren't driven for any other reason than being afraid to take too long to resilver the replacement. Um, there is some work coming in ZFS on Linux, and I'm going to talk about that in the new features part when we get to that. That I don't know if it's going to be the complete savior, but it looks to me like a really good solution to that problem. So it could be some good news coming on that. And this is what the UI looks like when you're doing a resilver. You get sort of a degraded instead of online is your state. You get a replacing verb. Uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. If you've done it in production, you've, you've looked at that and you say, why is it taking so long? Why is it still at 1% done and it's been four days? <laughs> okay, ZFS snapshots. We talked about a little bit before. We can get a little more detail. Um, I mentioned that you know having a mechanism in the code to indicate that the user wanted a snapshot will allow you to preserve the blue blocks. And the safeguard against deleting snapshotted stuff, blocks, actually occurs in the freeing code. And the freeing code, when you delete something, before it actually Delete. removes that block and returns its free space to your space map, it says, oh, is, is there a snapshot protecting this block? If so, I'll just leave it alone. So. That's why snapshots are basically constant time, because you're really just recording a like, tiny bit of metadata to say, as of this transaction number, protect this data from being deleted. And then it's sort of invisible in the delete path as far as your performance levels. Walk you through a very quick snapshot example. So this is on my little development machine, and I have a file system called tank slash test. Um, and I copied my syslog to it, and then I took a snapshot. I said ZFS snapshot tank test at snap1. That's just the convention we use in ZFS for making a snapshot. That last part could be anything. You can call it anything. You can call it Wednesday. People use timestamps and all kinds of scripted mechanical things there to keep track of what they're doing. And then I deleted the syslog, which after all, the whole point of snapshotting, it was like, oh, if I delete it, I can always roll back, or I can always get access to that because I did snapshot and protect it, right? So ZFS has this cool sort of hidden folder. And if you change directory into it, so see here, tank test dot ZFS, that's the hidden folder, snapshot. There's some other stuff that's possible, but in this case, snapshot, the name of the snapshot, I did ls, and there's the file. And you can actually, it's read only, but you can get it, you can use it, you still have it. That's auto-mounted if you just start to operate on it. Otherwise, then it's not clogging up your mount tab because if you have a million snapshots, you don't want that until you start using it. That's snapshot in action. Uh, prove to you that it's read-only. Okay. All right, rollback. Simply saying. Give me the state of the file system at the time I made the snapshot. Discard anything done since. In this case, what it discarded was a delete, so it put the syslog back. It's actually there back in tank slash test. So <laughs> you can take your snapshot that you've made and clone it into a first-class writable file system, and that's ZFS clone. In this case, ZFS clone, the name of the snapshot, the name of the file system that you want to create out of it, and then I do my ls in my new fs, and there's that same file. This is the point in the presentation when I decided I went for a long time without any pictures, <laughs> which is kind of boring, so I got a little desperate. <laughs> Try to sprinkle the pictures back in there, so. All right, ZFS send. This is a kind of a key feature of ZFS that a lot of people use. 
Um, it works with snapshots and not the live data because it's not really cool to try to like send a file system to another place when they're actively being written to because you'll have an unknown state. The f you, as I showed you how to take the snapshot, the file system itself stays online, obviously, during the send operation. There's no need to worry about live updates to that. They're going to happen. You have your snapshot. Everybody's cool. And the send stream can be redirected through redirection symbols, pipes, etc. So it goes to standard out, in this case, to a file. Um, I'm not sure. That's happened to be the size that it came out of with the syslog that was there. Don't ask me to explain that one. ZFS receive is your complement to send. It creates or merges the data in the send stream to a data set. It could be creating a new data set or it could be splicing that data into an existing one. And this is your example of sending to a remote location and just taking care of it that way. In this case, ZFS receive, the name of a new file system, and redirecting from a stream, which is in this case is the, is the file that I created in the previous step. And there's that famous syslog file that I have there. Yes. So combo up. ZFS send in the name of the snapshot piped to SSH to another server and the command to run on the other end. And this is what most people do with it. It doesn't not really that great when it's within the same pool because you kind of you already have the data. Right? Um, there are lots of scripts out there, homegrown at different companies, some are public, some are just people have done over the years out in the wild for entire a backup data protection schemes based on ZFS send and receive. So powerful feature, um, not perfect, but a pretty good feature of ZFS. No, it might be time for, oh. I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the incremental snapshots, of course. So rather than always snapshotting the whole data set for the purposes of creating a stream, uh, you can do incrementals. So in this case, it gives you a lot of granularity. ZFS send, dash I for incremental, the older snapshot and the newer snapshot, so the delta between pipe, and then it goes to whatever commands you can dream up to do in this case. Send it over to, I think this needs quotes around it, actually, this part, but host to, and then receive on the other side. So that's your time machine, sort of. <laughs> if you want to do it on a five-minute basis and go crazy, you can do that, for sure. Um, time for questions, I think. Anybody, questions on snapshots? Yeah. The, the question isn't about snapshots, actually. I wanted to go back a few mm -hmm. slides, but you don't need to go back. Well, you had two things where you talked about large disks and big disks, and like the scrub command and the resilver command can take a while. So I, since you say those caveats of those large disks, which we all have nowadays, mm -hmm. is ZFS really built for the large disks and storage systems that, you know, physical storage that we have? Um, that's a fair question. Um, I would just say that it's pushing the boundaries right now with the disk sizes that people have, just being completely honest. Uh, go ahead. Yeah, sure. Just to add one thing, um, in fairness to ZFS, RAID 5 has the same problem, and that's right. why you have RAID 6 and RAID 7, and that's akin to RAID Z1, 2, and 3. Yes. And so if you have these huge data sets that have these huge resilvering times, you need to store more parity to survive more failures. Right. Yeah. Probably a more positive way for me to answer the question is there's definite recognition, and I'm up here talking about it, and people are actively working on things to do about it, but yeah, it's a concern. Um, and there are strategies of just over-provisioning and using extra disks and things to get by, but yeah, fair question. It's a concern. 
I think someone else had a question too. Oh, and he did, he's going up now, and then you, you know. Yeah. So also going back a little bit back to caching. Mm -hmm. So you know, obviously, it's going to be really helpful to have that data cache somewhere faster. You know, on like in memory. Um, and it, it seemed like the cache was composed of two bins, more or less, like most commonly used and most recently used. Yes. Um, I see how both are useful. Like, is there a set ratio between those two bins that you found was like performant and fits all use cases, or is it adaptable based on what happens actually on the in the use case, or is it configurable? There are knobs that you can turn, like module parameters that you can tweak. I haven't personally yeah. done that, and there's also a um, an ArcStats Perl script that you can run, and you can kind of see the activity, and you have to kind of read up on it because there's letters in it like C which represents and there's all these different things but you can read you can see this and tweak it um, but there's a lot of work put into trying to do the right thing without anybody having to touch anything sure yeah. Yeah. but then you look at arc stats figure out look what's at arc stats in case, and, you, and then kind of shift it toward I think yeah there are some the knobs you can go in and change percentages and ratios and things cool. good question thanks when looking at, re at the mirror recovery and, and raid Z recovery times mm -hmm urge everybody to run the test. Do it. Yeah, good point. Just so you know how long it's going to take ahead Do it. of time. Do it. Know how long it takes. Derated 30 or 40 percent for com link and network issues. Mm -hmm. Make sure you know what the number is and what the number can what number can be tolerated and how you act accordingly. Don't the big danger here is not it happening. The big danger is the surprise of discovering in a production situation that you have a problem. Yes. Good point. Thank you. Hey, how the things with the SSD support for ZFS? The Trim support for SSD is a long awaited feature, and I think it's still not landed in the. Which ZFS. support? I'm sorry. Trim, Trim, the, uh, SSD Trim command. Yeah. yeah, so it's like long time open pull request, which was closed, and that issue oh. was opened, closed again. Trim. Yeah. There was a feeling that it didn't really help performance that much, but I don't think that's correct. I think there is recognition that it should be in there, and I think it got put back into this 08 release, so you should be seeing trim support. So you can say Z pull trim to force the SSD to do the garbage collection then at that time. Yeah, because this is the only feature which is actually like I'm currently using better better FS on the, my workstation mostly because I have a couple of SSDs and I want to have a trim, and yeah. so but I don't satisfy with better FS like stability. So I'm looking at the switching to ZFS. But yes. look trim. for it in the, this 08 version that that's coming up. The question was about trim support for SSDs. Um, my understanding of that is. The big problem was that, not that the garbage collection didn't occur on the drives, but that it just could happen at random times. Is that your understanding? Is that what you're looking to have solved or be able to have it to happen when you want it to happen rather than on the drive firmware schedule? Yes. Or? So, so basically when the file system can mark the block as free, so SSD don't need to basically, so it knows that you don't need to erase it right. and keep the resource of SSD basically. Right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So we are looking at uh, a file system with a snapshotting capabilities. So we are actually comparing ZFS and BetterFS. Yes. I just want to know like, which one is more mature at the moment and uh, which one is seeing more production usage. I would probably put that back to the community here. I'm not, I don't really know that much about BetterFS. Um, you saw from the history how long ZFS has been around. Um, there is a fork between what Oracle has, did and continued to do up until even now, still supporting it in Solaris and this community version that I've been talking about to you here today. So um, maybe over drinks tonight, people can, uh, at the place we can kibitz about that. A word of caution on solid state devices. While on the surface they casually look like rotating devices, they are not. Mm -hmm. They have a variety of attributes that are different and it's not, once again, the time to learn that there are issues. 
is not when you ram into them. They have lifespan issues, they have performance issues, they have uh, disconnected power lifetime issues. You can take magnetic media off the machine, park it on a shelf and come back two years, three years later. I dare say if you read the spec sheets, I mean the real spec sheets carefully on SSDs, you will discover that is not the case which has implications for compliance and evidence recovery. Mm -hmm. Those of us who uh, deal with situations where legal exposure exists, just throwing an SSD on the shelf is not necessarily a good practice. You, you need to be aware of these things so you don't get blindsided. Thank you for that advice. Good advice. Does ZFS uh, mark bad blocks as permanently bad so it doesn't go back into the free pool? Yeah, that one I wasn't 100% sure about. It was, somebody asked that earlier, I believe, and um, I'm hoping the answer is yes, it does. But I'm not certain about that. Is there a way to list the bad blocks, like a command to say list all the bad blocks? Not that I know of. Okay, thanks. The problem is a lot of clients hide them. Mm. The comment was that some drivers and devices hide those blocks there, just so we have it on the recording. All right, thank you for those questions. All right, we're pretty far into the presentation here. Thank you for bearing with, you know, it can be a little dry, but there's a lot to talk about with ZFS. So there are some upcoming features which are important. Um, they come from the, the ZFS on Linux community which are companies like Delphix and Intel and Datto and others who just need to have these things. So they have people on staff who just work on the open source. So um, it's not all entirely altruistic reasons, right? Gotta, we need these things to run businesses, so they s send forth people to work on them. One of them it was called allocation classes. This is simply a way to segregate devices within your pool for the purpose of metadata storage, so, i.e. something fast. <laughs> so, like I showed you before, the log was a separate class and it had that little partition, a mirrored partition. Now you can do the same thing in our new 08 version that's coming up. <coughs> Excuse me. You can have fast reading and writing for your metadata, which is hugely important for some of the limitations of things we talked about. Um, I'm really eager to try this at Datto to see if it can improve um, scrub and resilver times because though that metadata that you need to get, you can be satisfying those reads from a faster SSD. Um, I believe if you make it big enough, you can tune things to put your indirect blocks on there as well, which would be a huge win because if you can picture trying to read in like you want to just cat a huge file, you're reading indirect blocks constantly from all over your pool, you're, so your random reads are just, you're splatting them everywhere. If you could satisfy those from a faster metadata class, you could really probably get a pretty big win on that. So that's exciting. Encryption, which, uh, shout out to my colleague Tom Caputi at Datto is the guy who contributed this to OpenZFS. It's at rest compression, uh, encryption, sort of like compression. It's on the fly. It's encrypted on the right and stored that way in the block, and it's decrypted when you read it. Um, I'm not an expert on how all the different MAC and SALT and the stuff is calculated. Tom's really good at that. If I could have dragged him down here today, that could be a whole other presentation. But uh, nice to know that that's coming. Um, a lot of work went into raw send, which was mentioned before in the context of compression, that you could, um, when you send a ZFS stream, a send stream over the wire, that you're not decompressing and recompressing, et cetera. Same thing with the ability to send the encrypted data over without the key. So it's over there, it's stored, but it can't be read by anybody. Nice, very nice to have for certain business models, other reasons. Device removal. 
I've been bragging about ZPool Add, how it's just like adding RAM and you can add to your pool. But it was up until recently with this new version coming out, impossible to remove any VDEV from your pool except the log. Um, so a lot of times it's not an issue. You're just like pounding data, you ran out of space, you put in another shelf, you cable it up, you do ZPool Add, and you have more space all of a sudden. Um, but there are use cases where you just didn't type in the zpool create or add command correctly. <laughs> uh, you, you created a stripe when you wanted a mirror or vice versa. And the very second that you hit return on that create command, it goes and splats the information out there, the metadata, and it makes its mark on the disk. And you, you can't be like, oh, control Z, control Z. You can't, you, you can't, you can't get out of there. Or maybe you over provisioned a pool and you just want to take the disks out because you don't need them. So I'm not an expert on this feature. I know it was very difficult to write and test. It caused some disturbance in the force for a while there, but I think it's, uh, it's, it's come together such that uh, they're starting to look for people to download the 08 version and play with it, which we're going to start doing at Datto because we want some of those features. Some of the ones I've mentioned, we're willing to participate in the test effort and uh, beat on this stuff a little bit. I don't know if this one's going to make it in the 8.0 version. This is a big feature. It's a declustered RAID, known as D-RAID. Um, we kind of beat the dead horse of the resilver times, but we know it's a problem with the bigger disks. It's gotten worse. Um, I have a picture on the next one that kind of explains this, but the general idea, it allows your disk rebuild, rather than being focused on reading from a few disks and writing onto one replacement drive to decluster that uh, concept, spread that information across slices across multiple disks. I like to use the number 60 for some reason. If you had to see it, 60 disks. And I'll show it in the picture in a second. So that when you're rebuilding, you're able to use the full disk bandwidth that you have of all the drives for read and all the drives to write, and it'll become clear how that works. I'm just going to go to the picture. OK, I hope I can explain this correctly. It's a, it's a little tricky. Um, but in a traditional RAID, with a hot spare, disk 10 is the spare. So something goes wrong with one of disks 0 through 9 in this configuration, and we want to substitute disk 10 for, I don't know, 7 that failed. <coughs> We're going to be write limited by the fact that all the writes that have to occur are going to go to disk 10. OK? Um, there's room for improvement there. Instead, what if we sliced up the disks? So each, if the spare is 10, parts of 10 live on all the other drives in the pool. So for example, it's in the third column of disk 2. It's over here on disk 3. So the concept of a spare has been sliced up, spread across all the available drives to be, to be not a spare disk, but n slices of space on all the drives that represent enough space for a spare. Okay, So what's going to actually happen on a RAID rebuild is we're going to be engaging on the read side all of the drives. So that's faster than reading from a select few. And writing to all of the drives. And the performance improvements, there was some presentations on this at the um, last developer conference. And it, it looks pretty good. This is not something that was invented by the OpenZFS crew. It's, I believe, IBM was the first to do declustered RAID. Um, so there is literature out there. You can go out and read white papers on it and see what the imp performance improvements are. But it's good. Question, yes, sir. Observation, the more important effect besides load balancing is where usage 
The MTBF of drives is heavily dependent on how many operations the seek mechanism does. And in a traditional RAID 5 environment, the RAID, the redundancy disk gets hammered mm -hmm. with a lot more operations than the members of the standard right. family. This has the effect of evening out the, the work workload and therefore not creating a situation where the MTBF of the redundancy drive is a fraction of the rest of the drives in the array. Right. Thank you. So if you've got a box hanging around with 60 drives in it, or even 12, something, and you want to play with this, you can probably go on to GitHub and get a copy. I've been meaning to do that myself, because I really want to see how I want to take it out for a test ride. Yes, sir. So question, how is this different from saying having triple parity instead of double parity? So why would you use a hot spare in this configuration rather than uh, having a higher level of parity? Good question. I'm going to phone a friend on this one. <laughs> <laughs> Brian, the question was, why is this any better than just going to a higher parity level with, with RAID 6, 7, or RAID Z2, 3? And Brian has a... Thanks, Brian. So basically, if I understand correctly, it's actually RAID 3 with the RAID calculation of all this. Oh, in this case? No, it's not RAID calculation, it's all. OK. Thanks. Matt? OK, just to make this a little more, I think I've only got a few slides left, so thanks for hanging tough with me uh, a little bit on the Linux part of this. Uh, CFS was ported to FreeBSD by Pavel, and it was done in 2008, so it's been over in FreeBSD for a while. I don't know if there's been complete unity between that version and the OpenZFS, but I know there's active communication and a lot of cooperation going on with that. Um, just going to talk very briefly about what was involved in the port from Solaris. Open Solaris back then, or it was probably a Lumos in 2008, 2009. Tough call. So where system calls were different between Solaris and Linux, there was a compatibility layer or a shim created. Um, try to leave the ZFS code unchanged. So if it was like uh, mutex enter or something in Solaris style of doing it, it still says that in the code. That might be a a pound define or another function in the compatibility layer for how it actually works. Um, some areas of concern were atomic add and atomic compare and set were available on Solaris and needed to be adapted. Sleepable mutexes and uh, other synchronization primitives. Someone already brought up the kernel memory allocation. The Solaris has a sort of slab approach which in some, I'm not an expert in that, but does differ from Linux and can interfere with your ARC. So there was some work done there. K stats had to be sort of mimicked through the proc file system of Linux. Um, and some of your like basic data structures that are in there like NV pair and NV list, name value, and AVL trees were brought over. That was done in the BSD port. So meanwhile, some of our colleagues at the uh, Livermore National Labs have also been working on this. They use Lustre there. Um, I'm, again, not my thing, but it's a massively parallel distributed file system. They were using a modified version of ext4 themselves, but they were looking for more. They wanted scalability. They wanted the data integrity features that they found in ZFS and some of the management functions like the zpool command that I've talked about quite a bit. So they also did a port, not to FreeBSD, but to Linux. 
This was their timetable, which I'm just going to let you read. Um, because of the way they were doing um, luster, they didn't really, they weren't using like the POSIX layer. So that got added later and is a feature for most people who use it, like um, the ability to mount a file system and unmount, you know, all that stuff, the ability to chamod and just do all the stuff that you need to do. Uh, that layer was added. Um, through the history, some brave people in 2011, 2011 were using it, production in 12, and GA in 2013. So that was the port that was done by them. They have uh, three or four people who work there who are extremely active and kind of manage the builds, and they do a lot, a lot of work on this. So shout out to them. It's a great work there. They also were influenced by the BSD idea and kind of the obvious thing to do anyways. They created a, uh, also an SPL, a porting layer. Um, some of the issues that were bumped up against uh, 8K stacks in the kernel. Um, I recently spent a long time rewriting a recursive function in ZFS that was running in the kernel module that would blow, blow out the stack if it you know, had enough data to operate on, which actually happened on a, a Datto server. So I said, someone go fix that. So that was a pain. So. All the recursion is going to be gone at some point because of Linux, because you just, it was more generous. I don't know what the stack size, I don't remember over on Solaris, but it was, it was big enough that you didn't really see this stuff. And pools are getting bigger. People are doing more snapshots. They're nesting things at deeper levels. It's just starting to flush out a few of these issues. Um, again, the VM issues, there was some effect, there was some work done to sort of emulate the slab, the Bonwick slab approach that's in Solaris. And uh, we already talked about the cache not being integrated with the ARC, so there was some work to just get around that. Fast forward for them. They use those distros for what they're needing to do, CentOS and Fedora. Um, over, probably north of that now, well over 100 petabytes of management. Datto has a lot too. We have over 450, probably 500 now. So people are using this. It's, it's out there in the wild and um, a lot of data under management under ZFS. I already promoted the GitHub location for, for the fearless ones out there. And this is uh, a couple years ago, I took this picture and it was, GitHub was generous enough to let us use their space for a, a day two of our developer conference out there. So snapped a picture there. Just a plug about what the OpenZFS community is. Kind of came together in 2013 to try to unite the different versions. I already bragged about the Windows uh, port, which is crazy, but and we have the Dev Conference every uh, September, October in San Francisco. Where I work at Data, we're actively contributing to that. We have three ZFS developers. I'm one of them. Some of the companies that are part of OpenZFS there. Delphix is a big one. They do a lot of work in OpenZFS. All these companies at some level are, are involved, either with the, uh, the Illumos flavor or the, uh, the Linux flavor. And a few Twitter accounts there to follow. Um, that's the end of my presentation on ZFS. Thank you for hanging with me. Are there any questions before? Yes? Just the licensing of ZFS? <laughs> I know there were some issues. I didn't really follow them because I don't use ZFS. But I know that Ubuntu, I guess, took the lead on this, and then is, it that, is that all resolved, or is that still going on? I don't know if it's resolved as much as people are just kind of going forward. Uh, we, we use Ubuntu at Datto. Um, it's a kernel-loadable module, ZFS, so um, 
I think that was part of the way around some of the CDDL versus GPL issues that are out there. Um, as far as I know, people are just going full steam ahead with it. Yes. Right. So I have two questions. Uh, one question, um, I was wondering about changing the backend geometry of your, your Z pool. It sounds like you have to wait for eight for that. Is that correct? Like if I wanted to add an extra parity uh, drive, you know, for example, to a, a Z pool, uh, a, a, um, a volume. So right now the granularity of Z pool add is another top level VDEV of whatever you have already. So if you have a stripe of mirrors, you can do Z pool add another mirror. Um, with the 08 version, you'll be able to remove one of those top-level VDEVs. As far as taking a RAID Z from a one parity disk to a two, I don't know if that's possible. I don't think so. Okay. Also, do you have any pointers for the audience about like how to get started? Just how to like is there a best website or something like that to go to? of these, like if they wanted to set, go home and set it up. Yeah, I think it's, uh, this is the one you want, I believe, zfsonlinux.org, and it has some sort of cookbook stuff there on where to get it, how to download it, and create a pool. Thank you for those. Yes? Uh, just to kind of add a little um, response to Brian's question, basically what we found was ZFS send and receive is the answer to all your trouble. Um, <laughs> it required kind of 50% slack capacity when we would run into these issues. Um, some We would have like horrendous metadata issues where just like doing a zpool status would go out to lunch permanently. Mm -hmm. And we knew it was time to send to the like uh, backup, you know, slave server and then switch back. So operationally a big pain in the butt. However, yeah. y it would get you out of like every troublesome scenario basically. Thank you. That, that's a creative solution. And the necessity is the mother of invention, right? <laughs> I think we're good. Any other qu going once. Okay. Thank you. <laughs>